My name is Rolf. If you are on Pearlmonks, you might know me with the nick of Langs or Langs because it's a, it's a gr uh, great mystery where the name comes from. It's just an abbreviation of my family name, Langsdorf. There are many interesting things to tell about me, so many that it would be in an extra presentation. So I will just start with a presentation and then we can do it the next time. Um, I will show you uh, a quick overview what macros are, how I implemented uh, a pr uh, approximation of macros in Perl 5, and we'll show you some of the backgrounds uh, of the technical things, how I implemented them, and some of the applications to give you a, a feeling what macros are and how you can use them. Um, what are macros? According to Wikipedia, they are a small piece of program code that is being expanded by an interpreter or preprocessor into a larger piece of program code. It's a kind of metaprogramming. You can use it for debugging, for optimizations, for control uh, creating your own control structures, uh, for design patterns or all systems. You can use it for a lot of things. Uh, may I ask, uh, who has been at the last talk before the lunch? Okay, so you have a, oh, the presenter too. So <laughs> you have, you, uh, you might have uh, already an idea what macros are, but I will give you a, a, a short overview of uh, other macro mechanisms to be sure that we're talking about the same thing. Uh, most of you will know preprocessor macros in C. I will not show you preprocessor macros because they have a totally different implementation. They are a kind of template uh, uh, language because it's a... Uh, 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 language different from the language is like template toolkit and they are excessively used in the Perl source code which makes them practically unreadable for those not experienced and uh, they are actually uh, another pass they are run before compiling they are run only once and then they create the, the uh, C code or, or Perl code or whatever you use actually there is a flag in Perl runtime that you can run a preprocessor pre through it, forget it, nobody's using it. So it's kind of a, um, like template to toolkit, it's not what we are looking for. Then we have source filters in Perl, which are practically hated. And we don't want vanilla source filter, because source filters have mi uh, allow multiple runs and they may confuse the line numbers. While by including new code, they, the code gets expanded and the line numbers are different, so the debugger doesn't know anymore which code he is debugging. We have uh, um, uh, some core modules or some uh, popular modules like switch PM or smart commands PM, um, which are both from Damien as far as I remember. And uh, they are very fragile when you are nesting them. They are very fragile when you are combining different source filters. Because one source filter, both old source filters are ex uh, ex uh, expecting to see the same Perl code, a native Perl code. But if one uh, uh, source filter is ch changing, introducing his own syntax, another source filter will be confused. And I'm quoting one of these modules. They may create syntax errors in other parts of code. What we are looking for are syntactic macros, like in Lisp. May I ask who of you has uh, experience with Lisp? Okay. They are passed like a function call with arguments. They look like a function. They expand code at compile time, at the moment where the function is passed. But instead of saying, here I call a function, they call this macro function, uh, and this macro function injects code in place. So. They see the uh, and they see the arguments and the macro code as syntactic symbols. They see code, not values. Let give you let's give you an example which is a little bit uh, uh, special. Nobody talks about swap macros nowadays, <coughs> except if you have seen the last talk. And I'm showing you a rather dumb but easy to understand implementation of a macro in Lisp. You have here this, uh, instead of def function, you have uh, def macro. You say, uh, let uh, uh, temporary variable be the value of A, of the symbol A. 
then set the symbol A to the symbol, symbol B, and then set B to the, to the temporary. If you want to uh, translate this more or less into Perl 5, it would look like this. I hope you can read it more or less at the, uh, the back seats. Otherwise, you should have paid more. Um, it's, it takes uh, the values here, and it creates a template. In this case, it's a string and it I includes the values. It's not the real, no, 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 forget it. <laughs> I'm just showing something which looks like it would work, not that something that works. And um, it includes its own variable and so on. So you have an idea what it does because I'm showing you a kind of approximation and Perl for those who don't understand Lisp code. And then you call swap at this place, and while compiling, this is expanded. You got the idea? I was just lying to you, because actually we can't do this in Perl because it's syntactic macro. What we done uh, in the last example, in the last uh, pseudo Perl, we had dollar $A and dollar $B uh, getting the values. Uh, actually, what we get are the symbols. It means if there is an A and B, there is dollar $X, dollar $Y. It will be the symbol dollar $X and dollar $Y, and I use this uh, new syntax to include the symbols. And the cool thing in, in, in JavaScript, it doesn't have to be simply a variable. It can be a, a piece of code, which is in this symbol. So you can swap to, uh, uh, it doesn't make sense with swap, but you can think about a macro which is uh, taking different parts of code, nested code, and uh, replacing it in different places. We take questions afterwards, because I have a lot of slides, sorry. So uh, this is hypothetical Perl. We get the symbols, and this is not a string. This is also a piece of code. So it's also, it must be syntactically valid. If you have a string, it can be anything, and after expanding in you, it blows. This would not ever execute if it's not valid code. So you get the idea of a syntactic macro. So advantages of syntactic macros, no extra parsing required. Because we know only Perl can parse Perl. And the big sin of uh, filter simple is that it, it's... Um, giving you the impression that you can use the regex engine to pass Perl, and this gives you a quick results, but in the end it fails. So we don't try to pass ahead, we will not try to pass ahead in our talk. We will not have race conditions due to conflicting expansions if you have different macros. Nesting is easily done. We can call inside of a macro expansion another macro, and it's a proven, well-studied technology. We have to think about Lisp as one of the oldest languages in the world. It exists since the 50s. L macros were included later, but it's really well studied. So we have now, we had an overview of what syntactic macros are. We will recombine uh, two, three dubious technologies you practically never use to get at least close. We will combine source filters, but in a safe way. We will uh, include hooks in the, in the ink, and we will use attributes. The use mechanism. We all use the use mechanism. That's why it's called use. <laughs> um, we write use module list, but what is actually done, uh, is done uh, semantically, is a begin block it requires the module, so it, uh, it searches the modules, uh, evals it, and then it runs the import function. So it begin means it's executed at compile time. Okay? And because it's executed at compile time, um, it can execute arbitrary magic inside of this import. It cannot only export uh, subroutines and variables, it can also execute a source filter. So the source filter mechanism, how it is implemented, if you look at filter util call, which is a dependency of filter simple, is that you register callbacks for the parser. And every filter is chronologically executed, every source filter. 
The, this, it's kind of stream filtering, it's kind of piping one into the next one. The stream is based on lines or characters. It's useful without trying to parse Perl because you don't really need to parse Perl. You can do other things. You can also read passively without changing. Just what's the, so what's the source code of, my, of my, my Perl code? And what's very important, the filter can deactivate themselves. They can say, oh, it's okay. I don't need to be executed anymore. So I wrote a module called filter inject. You will find it on GitHub because I'm very perfectionist with CPAN modules. Uh, a macro module, um, what we actually do is we, uh, our implementation of macros are actually modules. We use the use macro mechanism, use module me mechanism, and use the import to execute a source filter, which in in injects code right at the place of the execution of the use module, or use macro, right behind the macro, and deactivates itself. So it doesn't try to parse what's, uh, what's behind, it doesn't try to parse what's ahead. The code behind and ahead gets untouched, so we don't have any conflicts. And because it's, uh, it's a use statement, we, uh, any macros which are, or source filters or anything which is before won't have any conflicts with the uh, two because it's valid Perl syntax, so we don't change the syntax. Uh, and as a goodie, we keep the original line numbers of the following code which is after the injected code, because Perl knows the line directive after a command symbol which can set the, the, co uh, the line number. So the classic problem of source filters are avoided. And let's look at uh, one application, inlining. Uh, Curtis is not here, isn't he? No. So uh, Curtis asked uh, some, I think, one year or two years ago in, in Perlmonks if you could have inlining. One problem is function calls in Perl are very expensive. If you have uh, m various function calls and you have a, 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 a loop which goes one billion times over this function call, you can, um, you can, um, you can save a lot of time by uh, inlining the code instead of calling the function if it's a proper macro and if it's well written. This can be, in some cases, a very good case. And this filter inject module gives us several possibilities. Here is one possibility, just you have the literal code. It's just to show how it works. But you can also call a, a function called template, which is executed at compile time, which returns the code which had be, uh, user has to be injected. Or you, you put everything in an extra module and call it macro. PM and then you give it the parameters and it can adjust itself. So let's give you an example, lexical export. We can export subroutines into the global namespace. That's normal, or variables. In Perl, it's not possible to export uh, lexicals, my variables, private variables. With macros, it's quite simple. Let's say, oh, let's say we want to have Let's say we want to have, uh, we have this problem here. We want to avoid this ugly syntax in Perl when we want to push into an array of hashes into an array. So we have to put uh, this parenthesis around this and the add symbol and 42. We can put, m some of you might not know, we can have an anonymous subroutine and a variable. And if, when it's called after an arrow, it's treated like a method. So the first argument is the object. So it will get this value at the first place, and we want to export this dollar push into the namespace, and we want to have it lexically. So at the end of the block, it's not available anymore because we don't want to pollute our namespace, which is relatively easily done. We define in our we define our module, we define a function push. And then in the import, we inject with the, I didn't come up with a better name, so I called it object, the code which, uh, uh, which, alias, which is uh, uh, assigning to my dollar push the, uh, the code ref to this push. And that is done. So another application, use 
macro uh, use module is not the only thing which is executed at compile time. If we have attributes in Perl 5, they are also executed at compile time. Because if you look in the, in the documentation for attributes, you can have function attributes and variable attributes if they are private. They translate to use uh, attributes and they get the package name of the variable and then they get uh, um, the package name of the subroutine, the reference to the subroutine and the name of the attribute. Same with variables. We have three variables here which are attributed and we have three calls. And these are calls to import at compile time. And we can use it to inject. Example. Let's say we want to avoid um, one of the things in Perl which is quite hard for beginners is the distinction between the two incarnations of a variable. We can have an array with an add symbol and we can have the reference to the array in a scalar. What about when I want to have them dual? I define my array here and I want to have at the same time the appropriate just time checking. Uh, and we have here, uh, we inject this part of code, which is assigning uh, the reference to $y. And we are, uh, we are uh, here joining the two namespaces, which gives us syntactically a lot of uh, advantages. And we, the, the only freedom we lose is to have two variables to an array and a scala with the same name. And practically nobody does it. So just think about all the dereferenciation, all the variable passing and so on, which you can, uh, can uh, avoid like this. Am I too fast? Everything okay for you? Okay. So the syntax till now with inject was a little bit ugly. We want to have it and we want to have more syntactic sugar. And we can expand our module filter inject by just assigning this uh, macro names at, uh, at import time of our filter inject, or we can use an attribute, you know now what attributes are, and say we have a subroutine, we want it to act like a macro. So you will say, oh my god, is he now writing a module into the file system at the time while including this? No. The thing is, you, we can have an, a hook mechanism I'm now a little bit confused if it's in the hash ink or in the add ink, excuse me, but uh, you, it's in the add ink. And in the add ink, you can include a code reference. It is because we are used it, most people use uh, the, the ink array just to put paths to the file, but they can also have a callback. And the callback is called with the same parameters which are when he wants to, wants to load the module from the file system. So we can use these hooks, which are callbacks, to generate code dynamically. We can return the module's code. And so our macro is expanded into a module, into a pseudo-module, which doesn't exist on the file system, which is generated just in time. So we have a macro handler which is included, and the macro handler looks for all uh, checks if the module name fits to the registered macros, and then he returns the appropriate code. Problem solved. So it's totally uh, transparent for the import mechanism. And if you have seen the WebEx uh, talk where we are talking about dynamically loading modules from, uh, uh, not WebEx, um, WebAssembler talk about uh, WebPerl, where we talk about dynamically loading uh, uh, modules from the f uh, from the internet, this could be this is also implemented by hooks into ink. So we already saw this because our our use inject, which which I've show, uh, shown you, is just implemented this way. So I don't need an extra example for this. But um, let's let's look again at uh, our naive swap macro. So, oh. um, so we want to include, I've just shown you how it's implemented in Lisp, but we want to implement it now here in Perl. And we do it in a dump way because we could do list assignments. 
just assign x, y to y, x, and then we don't need a temporary variable. But we're doing it in a way because I want to show you, uh, talk about hygienic macros too. So we have here a temporary variable, and we, at the time of the compilation, we, uh, we take the reference to the aliases of the arguments which are passed into the macro. So they are available here as a code reference, and because they are aliases, we can also assign to them, and they will be put into the variables which are seen by the macro. So dollar $A, dollar $B, are, um, we don't have the possibility to see them syntactically as code, but we can at least have the aliases. So this works already, more or less, but do you see the problem? It's namespace pollution. What if dollar $temp already exists? What if dollar $arcs is dollar already exists? So the symbols inserted in a code may collide with surrounding code, or the code injected, if it's symbolic, may collide. So in Lisp, you have different techniques, but in the end, I told you, it's a very well-known technology. They ended with the hygienic macros. Dollar $temp could already exist in surrounding surrounding scope, so Remember, in our model, macros are modules, and modules have a namespace. And this namespace has to be reserved. Nobody else has the right to use dollar swap namespace as a swap package. So, as a beneficial side effect of our quite dubious technology, we can use dollar swap temp, dollar swap args. It looks a little bit ugly. I could smooth it by aliasing namespaces. But uh, this can't collide. And if you have a variable dollar temp, it will, my dollar temp, it will never collide with this one because it is in totally different namespace. The binding of the symbols is into another, another namespace. So let's take a more practical example. I saw a complete talk some years ago at the jump workshop about the problem of dumping variables for um, debugging, but you don't want these variables to show up in production code because using a function to dump these variables costs time and this is time critical code. So we can have, uh, you know, maybe from data dump the, uh, the command pp which dumps uh, uh, variables and we use, uh, we define here uh, a macro pp which takes, okay that's ugly, it takes the strings and not the symbols of the variables you want to dump and creates this dump because they are executed as, um, as strings here, and this works this way. But what if we don't want to see this in, in production? We can just add a switch, a compile switch, off. And we can say at the begin block, somewhere before, we want the switch to be off when we are in environment production. So we send, uh, there are various po uh, um, possibilities to implement this. But I thought uh, environment vari variable where it says I'm on production and it says I'm off and then it's not executed because, uh, where's the off? Wait. Uh, here. We just, the same code like before because the slides are too short, you might not see the, the lower lines. We make a return undef if it's off, and then the macro is not expanded. Problem solved. So, till now, it's, it's, you see, you can already solve a lot of problems without having all the might of Lisp with a symbolic expansion. And we might even get to this point. But we, ro we solved already a lot of problems which are very, very hacky to implement in Perl. But let's take a vision for more advanced uh, implementations. Ruby has as a killer feature domain-specific languages. I have 20 minutes left, or? Uh, yeah, that's 20 minutes. So we have a lot of time for discussion. Sorry, I'm a bit fast. Uh, have I been too fast? OK. So Ruby has as a killer feature domain-specific languages. Um, you all know domain-specific languages. It's, it's just a fancy name for when you use a regex. It's because 
you can have a reg ex expert, which is an expert in regular expressions, and you can use this, uh, he's an expert in this domain, or in SQL, and he works together with a Perl expert, or a Python expert. So, actually, it's about uh, having people which are specialized in some field, and they can easily work with this language, with the sub-language, without needing to know the rest of the language. And per, uh, Ruby does it with functions which, which are uh, disguised as bare words. So they look sexy because they have no parentheses around them. And they often use autoload mechanism. In Ruby it's called missing method or something like this. In Perl it's an autoload. So if you don't have, a, it, if the function is pre, isn't predefined, then it will look into autoload, what can I do with this name? You may might know in CGI it had an implementation for uh, domain-specific language to create uh, HTML, which was uh, outsourced now by Lee, into, and it was uh, it was an autoload mechanism. It saw a tag called uh, href or a or uh, I don't know what, and it looked into autoload and it expanded it automatically. So Ruby actually stole a lot from Perl. Ruby is actually and I can't repeat it often enough because nobody talks about it. It's a love child of Perl and... Uh, what's the fucking language again? Um, Smalltalk. It's a love child of Smalltalk and Perl. Because if you look into the details of Ruby, it's so Perlish. Semantically, not from the syntax. The people only see the syntax, but in the inside. So why not sex up Perl? Actually, Perl requires bare words to be predefined. You can't have a bare word before the compiler has seen sub bare word is a function. Otherwise, under strict, it doesn't work. Bare words can run through autoload. So we have more problems, and the Ruby guys are also struggling with them. When you import a DSL, if you import a bunch of commands into your namespace, you're polluting your namespace. You have to get, you want to use this DSL only in a small part, but you don't want to have it to pollute all your file. And multiple DSLs can clash in the namespace. What if you have two domain-specific languages which use the same command? So our approach, we inject a dynamic package. We inject a package definition in a lexical scope. So the package is restricted to the scope. And the DSL grammar is encapsulated. I'll give you here an example of a hypothetical. I'm toying around with a SQL DSL. So that you have a feeling how it could look like. And this works by injecting a package. Actually, it injects, in this case, it injects two packages, three packages. Because we have a join. So the, the, the fields, the columns of the table one are, uh, are packed into um, the namespace T1. It's, this is an as construction in the SQL. The, um, the columns from table two are in the table in package T2. And then we have a joint t uh, of both uh, tables, which have the namespace. And the, uh, at compile time, we know the schema already. And it's, it's toying. It's, look, vision. Don't ex uh, show, uh, demand from me that I give you the code right away. And these are just exported Perl functions, where, ands, ors, and ors, which are just also exported into the joint package. And they are, they are it's just um, nested calls. So the, the fields are just, just uh, constants which hold an uh, object. And the object has overloaded the, um, the operators. And in the end, we got a syntax tree from the SQL, and then we can uh, work with this. Well, I've sh I'm not a uh, uh, DSL talk would take another talk. It would be even longer than presenting all about me. But um, I just wanted to show you how cool it is if we can just inject a package. So you may have know SQL abstract. SQL abstract is a kind of DSL2. It tries to achieve the same because the, the example I took before was just uh, from this example from the, from the pod of SQL abstract. And my example is much more complicated than this one. And it, they have to work with arrays and uh, hashes and they have to include the operators as strings. And you see how, how limited it is if we work with the data structure. And one of the 
secrets of Lisp is that C Lisp doesn't really know a distinction between data and code because every code is also data and every data is also code. And this is what we achieve with this DSL. We can generate, we can use this DSL to just generate the same output like uh, SQL abstract and SQL abstract executes this and creates a SQL statement with the um, with the placeholders and with the bindings. Okay, another example, a concise object-oriented syntax. Um, I think, I haven't been in Glasgow last year, I think Ovid started the discussion last year in, the, in, the, in his uh, talk that he wants a more concise object-oriented syntax in, uh, in uh, Perl and he was suggesting something like class point has with a has directive and methods and so on. And he wanted to have, a, you don't need to, in, this, in his model he don't, uh, didn't want to uh, act with dollar self. To unpack dollar self into a variable, he wants that uh, the variables are automatically uh, bound to, uh, to this dollar self arrow and so on. And I wrote as a proof of concept a macro which does it with this syntax. You have used class point, it generates a package point for the, it, uh, in, it can insert, it, um, it uh, unpacks the attributes. Actually, we can also read the type because the, uh, Perl has a syntax for types which is not used, which was, was never implemented. But as, as soon as we have attributes, we can get the type because the attributes are called in the namespace of the type. <laughs> and if, that, if we register the type that they, have, uh, that they are inheriting, the attribute handler, we're done. And what it also does is that this package, uh, we can look, the, it's in an RFC in the meditations in Perlmonks if you're interested in the details. It's also including um, this, uh, we don't parse ahead. So how do we know which methods were defined inside of this lexical scope? What we do is we are also uh, exporting a lexical variable which is an object. And a lexical variable is uh, destroyed at the end of the scope. What happens with objects which are destroyed? They call the destroy method. And the destroy method inspects the namespace because it knows which, uh, which uh, class was defined. Uh, parses all of this and expands it and then it wraps all the, f uh, all the functions with a wrapper which binds $y to the reference of $self y so that we, this is both ways, we can write to it and we can read for it and I personally like two dollars because I like sigils to be expressive and I can see right away oh this variable is an instance variable just going around to show you the, how mighty macros can be. So Outlook, I showed you a use macro mechanism. And the advantages are they're combinable, contrary to, to source filters, vanilla source filters. They allow nesting. You can call a macro inside of macro. They don't require a new syntax. They avoid namespace pollutions. They can be hygienic. And they respect lexical scopes. The limitations are use must start as a statement. This is a, a non-statement is something which returns a value. So if you want to have a value return, you have to uh, wrap it into a do clause. And because of some limitations of source filters, it has to be the unique statement in line. Because the source filter is, uh, is um, the, the return value, the injection happens at the next line. And they are not really syntactic macros, so there we could continue to work to get into the real code. Because at the point where the, our macro is called, it's already compiled. So I could use be concise or be deep parse, look into the op tree, and look what was the code that I got, and could decompile it, and then I could really have a syntactic macro. But this is just fantasy. For the future, there is keyword simple. And uh, I personally like that we had this use macro mechanism because one of the first things you'll read in Lisp is 
don't overuse macros. Only use macros if you really need to use macros and you can't do it with simple functions. Because macros have an extra level of brain fuck. You can do marvel with macros, but you can also fuck yourself with, sorry, with uh, the, the discussion level on Perlmonks is deteriorating and now uh, my language too, sorry. But um, you, can, you can really destroy your whole program. You can insert bugs you can never find again. So, but keyword simple allows to define a keyword. It has the same restriction that it only works into a statement. I talk to the author, he thinks that it's a, it's a bug in the implementation, implementation of keywords, uh, of keyword uh, pluggable keys, of pluggable keys. Pluggable keys, it builds on pluggable keys which works since uh, 512, 514. In 514 they fixed some bugs. And it's unclear where the expression bug comes from. This is, the, this is an expression. This is not feasible uh, at the moment. So it has the same. But we can define, I'm working on writing my macro, my macro framework in a way that you can just plug in keyword simple. And if you really don't want the use macro expansion, you just write macro. So this means we have a, a stable mechanism, a stable framework, which works back, probably, I haven't tested it yet, but till 5.8 or so. And we have a fallback. If we want to write a module which works till 5.8, we use a use syntax. If we don't want, we can avoid the use syntax. Thank you. We should have 10 minutes or so for discussions. Yes? So the single evaluation rule, if you go back to a swap example. Which one? Uh, maybe the first one. It doesn't really matter. Uh, it seems you were doing the same thing in all of them. But you are, in, in the swap example, you are injecting the same code several times, right? Yeah. So uh, I, I noticed. Mm -hmm. I have to repeat it. The problem is if you're injecting code which has side effects. Let's say it's a tight variable which uh, protocols that it is, it's executed. And you have uh, here. So you have, uh, this is uh, an alias to $x or $a. This is an alias to $b is the one. And Normally at a swap we want this to have side effect only once because it's only in one line. But we are using it several times. But I told you this is up to the author of the, uh, of the macro author and I told you this is already a very stupid implementation with dollar temp because we have list assignments. But this is something which I'd, you say you can solve this automatically? So, but actually, uh, as I told you, use macros only if you know what you're doing. If it has side effects, you should check for the side effects and warn the user. Um, we, the other problem I came aware in the last talk is if you're using a global uh, variable, and this is, uh, I'm not using threading very much, but if this code is executed in two different threads at the same time, I'm not sure, I'm not an expert in threads if uh, the namespaces are separated. I expect if you don't yes. Share the variable, if you don't share the variable, it's okay. Then it should be okay. Thank you. I will, uh, uh, you come in the, into, into the thank you part. Five minutes for more questions? Yes? If I wanted to do it automatically, I had to parse the code. Right. And this is a string. So I would need to use db dparse to parse it and to rewrite it. I had another project where I tried it, and bdparse is not always uh, reliable. So no, I could. There was a module from uh, Rhiny which could rewrite the op tree. 
I forgot the name. I could use this, but no, that's too much. I think this is in, this is really in the in the, the author should do it. But what we can do is we can warn the author. This is not hygienic. Because we know which uh, parameters come from the input mechanism. We, know, we can easily, with Padwalker, inspect which uh, variables are defined inside of the scope. And if he uses these variables, and they are not uh, bound to the, to the package of the macro, we can tell him, don't do this. Be aware of what you're doing. That's why we have warnings in Perl. Thanks for the question. Next question. I think we have uh, three minutes or so. Okay, I hope it wasn't too fast. I was rushing through it. Thank you. <laughs>